You're, you should all be familiar, Leach's Lynch's disease, atypical pneumonia, um, characterized by um, a fairly high mortality, um, 10 to 40 percent, 40 percent being if you should get it while you're a patient in hospital. Um, the incubation period is usually considered to be between 2 and 10 days. We take a 14-day history when we were actually investigating outbreaks and cases. But there is some debate about this, and it isn't a nice U-shaped curve. It's got rather an extended end. And in fact, 10 to 15% of cases will be found after 10 days. The symptoms are very vague. There are no specific symptoms. You can say this person has Legionnaire's disease, although things like diarrhea, not so common with pneumonia, might be suggestive. And the other thing is the, the, really the severity of the systemic um, onset. That's just a picture of a typical um, lung that you would see um, with Legionnaire's disease. And I just want to mention, we often talk about the acute presentation, but in fact, um, it is not uncommon to get long-term problems, um, restricted pulmonary disease, and neurological problems being some of the, the biggest. And it's also a bit of a problem when we actually go to question people because they do get this retrograde amnesia and sometimes um, many of the key details are difficult to elucidate. This is just a very quick refresh for yourself. You should all be very familiar with this. There are over 50 Legionella species. Some of them are associated with human disease. Legionella sera group 1, Legionella pneumophila, sorry, is the one that, that we, we're very interested in and we believe is responsible for about 80 to 90% of all the infections. Of those, um, it's Legionella sera group 1, which is one of 16 sera groups um, that we find um, to be the commonest cause of Legionella's disease. Now, the fact that the urinary antigen test that we use is actually specific for Legionella pneumophila sera group 1 may also be a factor in why so many of the cases are Legionella sera group 1. Case classification, this is important because we, we use a clinical diagnosis plus the presence of one of the three um, microbiological confirmatory tests, either isolation from a clinical specimen, um, uh, the presence of urinary antigen, or less often now, we look at seroconversion. And as you'll see later, um, serology really uh, plays a very minor role now in um, Legionella investigations. So therefore, it's really very, very important that um, we, we, we get the microbiology right because laboratory diagnosis is absolutely critical. Without this, um, we do not have a definition. Without this, we cannot then link individual cases to environmental um, isolates and investigation. These are the four main methods. As I said, culture is considered the gold standard. Again, because not only do we identify Legionella pneumophila, but we also identify things like Legionella McDadii, Long Beach Eye, etc. Serology plays very little part, perhaps in the investigation of outbreaks, there may be a small part, but by and large, um, it's very little used these days. Um, antigen detecting, urinary antigen, I've talked about. You should all be familiar with that. And then finally, we've got nucleic acid, PCR, where um, increasingly this is being used and in fact, um, I suspect in the very near future, we'll be including PCR as part of the, the, the confirmed um, Legionella case definition. Looking at the diagnosis and detection, in terms of both the clinical and the environmental aspects, culture, really important. Um, serology plays no part in environmental, and increasingly we're seeing nucleic acid, both in terms of clinical and the environmental. Um, one of the, the things that's made a very, very big difference in terms of the investigation of outbreaks and trying to identify the cause is the development of um, this sequence-based typing. And as many of you will be familiar, um, it's based on these seven gene loci. I'm not going to go into them. You probably know more about it than I do. But all I need to know is that there is a very accurate way of subtyping Legionella. And in fact, I looked to my colleague Tim Harrison who heads up the reference lab for advice on this particular issue. I do know, however, that um, using a combination of these seven genes, we can identify strings um, of these individual allele numbers, and we then have an SBT which seems to be fairly unique and which allows us to do um, accurate um, profiling and mapping 
um, mapping across human strains to environmental strains, etc. So this is all I think in the pack and I don't intend to, to go into a lot of detail. I just want to try and raise the thing in your consciousness so that when we're talking about later, hopefully it makes some sense. Um, I think the important thing is though that um, culture, um, I think when we first looked at Legionella um, investigations back in the 90s and the two and year 2000, very many of the, of the, the cases, there was no um, sputum, there was no clinical um, specimen for culture. We've seen that increase in, in fact in 2010 or 11, I can't remember which, um, about 26% of the cases there was um, um, culture um, made. So that's quite a, an important step forward because as I say, that does allow us to link um, environmental specimens to clinical specimens and therefore identify potential sources. And this is just really giving you a, a feel for the way we would use it. In this context, I'm using the European travel scheme where we presented with two patients, both in different countries, both developing Legionnaire's disease, and they've been to the, a place, let's say, in, in Paris or, or, or in Rome. We identify a number of hotels they stayed at, and in fact, we may even have a cooling tower. Um, the first thing we'll do, we will identify its Legionella pneumophila, hopefully from culture, from clinical specimens, and then using um, some further um, MAB subgrouping, we can then try and further refine um, the examination so that by the time we get to the fourth layer, we can exclude things like um, Hotel C, we'd be able to exclude the cooling tower, whereas 10, 15 years ago, um, we'd have had a real problem. And then using the, the subtyping, we then were able to establish that in fact, when you look at it, you've got an ST9 for Hotel A, and you're left with the ST2, which links the two clinical cases and the hotel. And that's really the basis of, of what we try and do when we're investigating potential outbreaks. We're trying to piece together the evidence, the information, so that we can link clinical and environmental cases. This is a picture of the, of the surveillance form. It's actually about six pages long, fairly detailed. And in it, we try and collect useful information about what the patient has done, where they've been, etc. in the 14 days prior to the onset of their illness. We are looking to use this as a way of trying to see, um, based on severity, can we identify specific um, subtypes or ST um, subtypes, but we're not at that stage yet and there's a bit of further work to be done. I think it's also important to say at this point that um, it's probably um, you know, vastly underdiagnosed and I think there's two reasons for that. One, it's often cheaper to treat than investigate and I think you'll see from, from this, um, this is community acquired pneumonia from um, some HES data and you'll see that of 194,000, there were 194,000 unspecified community acquired pneumonias. And these are instances where it's just been a, a treat and we won't investigate. So an enormous challenge there in trying to, to refine um, you know, what actually um, the prevalence of Legionella is. However, there have been two studies done. One of them was done in Nottingham, which estimated that the prevalence was about 3%. Now, given that that would equate to 3,000 cases of Legionella, um, and we only see roughly 300, you can see there's a big disparity between what might be happening out there and what's actually being reported. These are the cases of Legionella. I've included confirmed and presumptive. And you'll see that up until about 2010, we were getting about 350 cases being reported each year. But for some reason, and I don't understand it, um, perhaps time will tell, we saw a sudden drop in the number of cases in 2011. These seem to be in the community acquired. In other words, the travel associated cases remained the same, the nosocomial related cases remained the same, but we did see quite a slump in the community acquired cases. Moving on then, we talked about mortality, and this slide demonstrates two things. It, talks, it shows the, the difference between the experience of men and women. The, the males of a three to four time um, are, are affected or diagnosed three or four times more frequently than women. 
Um, perhaps it's a behavioural thing. We know that smoking is a key factor and that perhaps over time we will see women catch up as smoking um, works its way through um, the age cohort. The other thing to note is the increase in the case fatality rate with age. Once you get into the 70 and plus, there's quite a significant mortality, about 20%. Again, this is just really illustrating um, not just the difference in age and gender, but the difference in where you acquire your, your Legionella. And you'll see from this that acquiring it in hospital um, you know, has a much higher case fatality rate than, say, associated with travel abroad or even in the community. Um, over the last 11 year, 10 years, rather, we've seen, one, at one point we hoped that we were seeing a downward trend in the case fatality ratio, then it went up. But over the last 10 years, we've seen it go from 9.1, and its most recent one is 8.1. You might, with the appropriate statistical test, be able to say that might be significant, but I'm not going to, to try and um, convince you of that. You just have to look at the graph, and hopefully what's happened in 2009, 10, and 11 will continue subsequently. These are the cases that, um, sorry, with Legionella, underlying medical conditions as well as age are an important factor. And really the two things to highlight, heart disease is, associated, is a factor associated with number of cases and smoking. Um, other factors um, variably associated, diabetes and immunosuppression being the other two factors. So people with um, heart disease and smokers, these are the group that are probably more likely to get Legionnaire's disease if Legionella is present. And I think the other important point to make at this point is that a lot of us, well, all of us could be expressed to the, exposed to the same level of Legionella, but only very few of us would actually um, get it. And it's some, there is some intrinsic factor within us that determines whether or not I'd quit Legionnaire's disease and you don't. And things like heart disease, smoking are, are just some of the factors. And to be honest, we're not really clear about what the other factors might be. This is really just trying to show what I described a little bit earlier. In 2011, we saw this marked decrease. Um, the travel as abroad, travel cases that were travelled abroad really didn't change. We saw it go from just under 40% of all cases to about 53% of all cases were travel associated. And the biggest reduction was in community acquired cases in 2011. Um, Legionnaire's disease, the diagnostic test, I put this up, it's really just to show that culture, which is a key element of Legionella, is improving. 26% of cases in 2011, and I hope that that continues. I think another important point to understand when we're looking at Legionella, we never find out the cases or the origin or the, or the cause of it in over 70% of cases. So there is a real challenge when it comes to trying to identify potential outbreaks. <coughs> Moving on then to look at things that are important in terms of the environment, and we see that these five elements are, are fairly key um, to the survival of Legionella in the environment. Stagnation, so anywhere where water can, can pool or lie is a potential source. They need nutrients. They, they act on a fairly wide range of pH, but tending toward the acidic. Temperature is really important between 25 and 45 degrees. Another important thing is um, the association with other aquatic species. This is a slide, fairly old one, but nevertheless still relevant today, showing that really in order to get continued growth of Legionella, you really do need to have nutrients. The top line shows hot water in a, top t in a, in a tank. The other two is filtered water and pure water. And Legionella does not survive very long without the nutrients it would get um, from some of these um, sources within a normal hot water tank. These are just some of the organisms in which um, Legionella um, lives. Very, an enormous number of amoebae can support um, Legionella and um, living actually within a protozoal organisations is actually um, very protective and this is quite a challenge when it actually comes to trying to treat systems that are already contaminated or, or colonised because it can survive up to 50 parts per million of chlorine inside 
um, some of these um, organisms. So um, it's a real challenge when it comes to trying to, um, to get, eradicate, well you can never eradicate, but to try and manage it. And it's also believed that because um, it, they will survive in these cysts, you can get Legionella carried up to 10, maybe even 12 kilometers from cooling towers um, um, as a way of distributing the infection. So a challenge when it comes to trying to manage and control this. And I think we're only fortunate that so few of the population are, absolute, are susceptible to it. Um, biofilms are, are a really key element when you look at Legionella in an environmental situation. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. Again, it's in the handout about what a biofilm is. But basically, um, you've got this initial conditioning layer. You then get a bacterial layer developing on top of it. And then eventually, over a period of time, you get biofilm. And this is really just a schematic picture of some of the features of a biofilm and why it, it is such a problem in trying to manage. In terms of what encourages a biofilm, there's a variety of things. You've got organic carbon, you've got dirt, you've got debris. But most important is scale formation. And scale formation is a particular issue in the south of England and, and some parts of the country where um, the furring and the pipe provides an ideal opportunity um, for biofilm to develop. At this point, I'm going to ask, does anyone know what that is? Would anyone like to hazard a guess? Well, I don't think you'll guess, but does anyone know what it is? No? That's a, a filter from a TMV valve with a biofilm. Um, that was taken from a hot water tap in a hospital um, where they were having recurrent problems with Legionella from that particular tap. So that was actually retrieved from a hospital filter in situ <coughs> in a sink in one of the wards. And that was representing a buildup of biofilm. And that's the sort of thing that will present a real problem in trying to track down within a water system exactly what the problem is and the, the sort of remediation required. You see that um, not only does the biofilm actually um, protect it, but it also gives it some important um, benefits in terms of growth. We talked about temperature being an important feature, and this slide has really got two or three things on it. One, it's showing the optimum range within which Legionella will grow, um, 25 to 50 degrees on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we've got um, the, the time it takes to kill 90% of the Legionella population. And you'll see that very few Legionella survive beyond two minutes at 60 degrees, which is one of the temperatures that we set in terms of control of Legionella. Two key temperatures, 20 and 60. Over in Europe, they actually talk about 25 and 55, but we've gone for 20 and 60 um, because of the, these two graphs. In order to actually disseminate the Legionella, we need to have a source of aerosol. And surprisingly, you get aerosols from just about anywhere where there's water. Water hitting a surface will create an aerosol. And all of these things have been associated at some point, probably, with the Legionella outbreak. Um, in terms of infection via an aerosol, it's not the spray. If you can see it, it's not really an aerosol. Aerosols are virtually invisible. Um, they're very small particles, and they have to be small because they go all the way down into the alveoli. And we talk about small particles of less than five um, micrometers, so they can be inhaled, inhaled deep into the lungs. And the final point about aerosols is that they can travel long distances, which is uh, an important element in terms of the investigation. This was a simple study just done looking at, you know, how easy is it to generate an aerosol? And this was a study done some time ago with the running a bath. You run the bath, you get a big upsurge in, in particles, you turn it off and within about 10, 15 minutes, they gradually start to go down so that about 20 minutes after turning it off, you're back to where you started. So something as simple as running a bath will create an aerosol and will be a means by which Legionella can be, um, be spread. In terms of survival, you'll see that, uh, again, Legionella um, will survive for some time in certain conditions. Humidity is a clear 
clearly an important factor here, but given the propensity to actually um, survive within spores, it's not um, fundamental. Just before we go on to this, does anyone have a washing machine, a new washing machine? Do you notice anything about a new washing machine that you maybe didn't notice with your old one? Well, one of them is the new washing machines have only got one source of one pipe in, whereas old ones had a red one and a blue one, hot and cold. And usually what's happening now is that people are buying a new washing machine and they haven't bothered to cap off the existing piece of hot water pipe because that's too expensive, so they just fasten it onto the cold water. And in a sense, what they've then just created is a dead leg or a blind end, which Legionella will multiply, grow, and could over time invade your system and then cause potential problems. So it's very simple things like that when we're looking at how we investigate and manage Legionella, which can be highly important. The other things, again, which are important would be the choice of materials. And you'll see here, this was a study looking at Legionella growth using different materials. And something like latex, very good for growing Legionella, something like copper will have a negative effect. So actually the material you use in your water system could actually be fundamental in trying to control Legionella within a hospital or within an environment. In thinking about Legionella's disease, this is the model I tend to use, the classic one of source, the vector, the host. And you need to have all three present, really, in order to get effective transmission of the Legionnaire's disease to occur. You need to have a source which is contaminated, you need to have a means of spreading it, the aerosol, and you need to have a susceptible host. And I think this little anagram, when, or this little model, when you're actually looking at potential outbreak is very important, especially when you're trying to carry out a potential risk assessment. If you've got contaminated water but there's no way for an aerosol to be transmitted, in other words, a closed hot water system, then there's not a problem. <coughs> So I think it's useful in terms of thinking about how you would approach a, a potential problem. This is some of the, the measures that we actually use in terms of trying to control Legionella. Um, the, the formation of scale is, is a very, very important factor in some places. And therefore, water softening is one way of trying to control um, the development of Legionella in the system. You reduce the scale. Um, prevent corrosion and hopefully reduce the habitat um, for the Legionella organism. In terms of design as well, I'm sorry this is getting slightly temp um, complicated, but when you've actually got a large hot water tank like this, there is a tendency for all the hot water to collect at the bottom. So some of the remediation measures we put in is what we call an anti-stratification pump. And basically that just tries to circulate the water from the bottom of the tank to the top. Now clearly, if you came across a tank like this on the left-hand side, there is a potential problem unless you've done this because you will get an optimum temperature where Legionella would grow and it's not uniformly hot throughout. So this is one of the ways in which we'd actually look to trying to minimise the risk of Legionella growing. In terms of um, looking at hot water systems, these are some of the, um, the, the, the issues that we try and address. We try and make sure that the quality of the water was good, that it was soft water. Um, we try and clean and disinfect any tanks that we have. Any deposits that would appear, and it's actually quite quickly, you can get growth of deposits in, in any sort of storage tanks, and you would prevent any stratification occurring. One of the other important factors is actually water storage itself. Um, if you have uh, storage capacity that will hold water for a month, you've got a real problem in terms of um, you know, an emergency because that is an ideal location for Legionella to grow. And increasingly we're seeing um, smaller tanks being produced, which is why some hospitals in the situation where they've maybe only got one or two days worth of, of water because it's a measure to try and prevent um, another issue happening such as Legionella. Um, the key element in trying to maintain a conventional hot water system is trying to keep it as near 60 degrees as possible. Um, and we do that with a variety of methods. However, one of the big issues and one of the problems is called thermostatic mixer valves. 
These are valves that were introduced to prevent scalding. They deliver water about 40, 42 degrees at the point. However, they do produce their own problem. So while we may reduce the risk of scalding in, in some instances, we increase the likelihood of Legionella growing in another. So this is the classic, you're trading off one benefit, or sorry, one risk against another. Um, and then the final point in terms of conventional control is about eliminating stagnation. We've talked about blind ends and dead legs. A blind end is something where there is nothing beyond it. A dead leg is a redundant piece of piping, still connected, um, and in which you can get, if there's a drop in pressure, either um, material coming into it or out of it. And these are the, the, the real problem when it comes to looking at um, how we might address potential issues and problems in, a, in an institution. This illustrates really just some of the problems. We can get 55, 60 degrees leaving the hot water tank and 55 degrees returning it, which is some of the legislation. However, you can get dead legs. Um, if I can work out how to do this. These are dead legs where there is no um, hot water circulating and they can maintain pressures of anywhere between 30 and 40 degrees. Ideal resources, reservoirs, sorry, um, for Legionella. And then finally, temperatures like this, ideal situation for Legionella to grow and intermittently um, work their way into the, the system. So really what I'm trying to do in, in describe some of these issues, sorry, I forgot this was, um, was done like that, um, is really just trying to, to understand the complexity. Identifying Legionella in the water system is really only the, support, only the start. When we go on to look at specific issues, this was a hospital outbreak. And in fact, one of the components that had been used in the hospital system should actually have been used in our pipeline, not in, in a water system. And so you are dependent to a large degree on the, the contractors, the people putting it in, to know that they've done it properly and it's been done appropriately. And you'll see, sorry, um, just here, this resulted, um, scale resulted in almost an occlusion of the, of the water so that what you ended up with was stagnation and a potential source of Legionella. This is taken from a Yugoslavian outbreak in a hospital and these were pipes that were actually buried in the wall and despite all the efforts originally of the hospital to try and find out the cause, they could not find it. But by progressive sampling, we were able to, to narrow it down to one section, at which point they decided to go into the wall. And when they got into the wall, they found that there were some blind ends. In other words, someone had at some point decided to revise the plumbing. Instead of taking it off and doing it properly, they just capped the end and therefore this was a source of Legionella in that particular institute. And until that was remedied and rectified, um, they had problems. This is the, the, the length of the piping, 110 centimetres long. That was the problem they had for a number of years. Just this small 10 centimetre length of piping buried in the wall. It says 15 millimetres, that's a mistake. It should be 150 millimetres. Sorry about that. But, um, until that was removed, they had Legionella problems, and once it was removed, it, it, it went away. This is another example of what we can run into. The bit on the left is a TMV valve, all nicely insulated, but nothing else has been insulated. You've got co cold water, hot water pipes, all mixing in the same area. The ambient temperature in that place was 35 degrees. Um, no insulation and so the cold water was being heated up to what was an ideal temperature for Legionella to grow and although the TMV was, you know, was working properly, actually the water going into it um, was already 35 degrees and the amount of mixing was minimal. Another example of domestic situation you might see at home, um, a, a sort of boiler which is turned into a heating cabinet again you can keep the temperatures um, you know, effectively fairly high. Moving on then to spa pools, and this is one of the issues that we've seen recently. Um, spa pools are a fairly new thing in the UK. 
But actually, um, these are incredible sources of Legionella and other organisms, Pseudomonas being one of the other one that comes to mind. Um, you can get them in a variety of places, and each one of these, um, you know, place, th these locations has been associated with outbreaks or individual cases. So um, they have enormous potential to, to cause infection. And that's because you've got a number of factors working here. Warm water, it's usually aerated, although it's often treated and not emptied between each use. And you get lots of people using it, so there's lots of carbon um, and tissue generated um, by the continued usage. They're also very difficult to keep clean. This is a large one. And one of the favorite places when we go out sampling is actually to look in these vents because they're very incredibly difficult to clean. And when you take swabs, um, invariably, um, you tend to find at some level of colonization um, with Legionella. So again, the problems with the spa pools, large surface areas, the quality of water, lots of carbon in there, tend to get poor management. Everyone hates looking after the spa pool. You know, you've got to do all sorts of things. It's fiddly, no one likes it. Um, but actually, it's one of the most important things to do in terms of monitoring, as we've seen recently. I put in this. This was a spa pool associated with somewhere not far from here, actually, um, where people would go to meet other people and you would um, indulge in various things. <laughs> and you can imagine there was quite a lot of carbon in <laughs> organic material in these spa pools. But the point I really want to make is that you know, these seating areas are very, very difficult to clean. You have the water level actually above and sloping into the um, to the to the floor, whoops, to the floor there, and um, there are real challenges when it comes to trying to, to treat that. I just want therefore to acknowledge all the people that have helped put these together because, as I say, the one thing you do realise is managing Legionella is a team effort. No, no one person can do it on their own, and um, you know I hope stimulated interest and maybe hear from you in the future. Thank you.